spoken to you a, a little bit about spotted winged dwarf biology in the past, so today I really wanted to focus on some current research. Um, but I will give a very quick spotted wing refresher, focus, focusing on some of the things that I just want you to remember about this fly. So spotted wing drosophila is a very small fly. It's about the size of those fruit flies that you might see in your house over your fruit bowl. It is unique because it will lay its eggs directly into fruit. Then the larvae develop within the fruit. And then I'll come back to this. We are not really sure about how they're pupating and where they're pupating necessarily in all crops. But one of the things with this bug is that it can reproduce very, very quickly. It can go from an adult to an adult in 10 to 15 days. It can lay over 200 eggs. So this is one of those bugs that, that just explodes uh, and the population is really worse later in the season. One of the things that people have told me is they have difficulty doing visual monitoring. So one of the things I wanted to remind you is when you open up a fruit and you're looking to see if you have pressure from spotted wing drosophila, the easiest thing to look for is movement. And what it will immediately do after that is go deeper into the fruit. So right after you open it up, look for movement. This is the quickest and easiest way to tell if you have pressure. Just go out there and open up some of the fruit. You want to pick the riper fruit. And often, as Kevin said, things in the center or lower in the, in the, in the plant are going to be some of the first places you'll see them. So that's the easiest way to look for them. The other thing I want to remind you is if you have a lot of extra yield, um, if, you're, if you your economic threshold may be different. So depending on what type of operation you're, you're, you're running, how much damage is acceptable. And that's something you want to think about whether you're using, going for a very intensive management strategy or maybe a little bit of a less intensive management strategy. So the first thing I want to talk about is some of our chemical control research. There are a lot of, there's a lot of great researchers do, trying to find alternatives to chemical controls. The chemical controls remain our most effective option for managing spotted wing drosophila. And one of the things that we've been looking into is spray carrier volume and how to get good spray coverage. So my PhD student Maggie Lewis has been funded by the Maryland Department of Ag, the Maryland State Horticulture Society, to look at how spray volume is impacting coverage. And this, what she's interested in looking at is if you can see a difference between using 50 gallons per acre versus 100 gallons per acre. And how she's doing this is she's putting out these white spray cards. She's putting them out at one and a half feet above the ground, three and four in primocane brambles. Center part of the canopy, also in the outer part of the canopy. So you can see in the center part of the canopy you can expect to have poor coverage because there's leaves and other things in the way. Then you have the outer part of the canopy doesn't have as much blocking it as the tractor is going through. <clears throat> One of the reasons that we put them on these bamboo canes is so that it moves kind of like real foliage would move. So these have the opportunity to move back and forth and get blown around by the air blast sprayer. We did this work at the Keatesville Research Station. They have a Durham Whalen 100 air blast sprayer. Pull, pulls behind the tractor. It has a standard head with a 24 inch fan, seven nozzles. We turned on these bottom three novel, nozzles on both sides. So we're aiming the spray lower. We drove through at three miles per hour, 150 PSI. And the way we got 50 versus 100 gallons per acre is we had nozzles that were calibrated for 50 versus 100. So that's how we were manipulating that. So you can look on our first date. So we've, we first did this on August 31st out there for our 50 gallons per acre. And these are the inner, low, medium, and high, and the outer, low, medium, and high. And then this is 100 gallons per acre, same situation. So one of the first things you might notice, so there's a decent amount of pink on the outer high, really not a lot of pink on the low. So we used a pink dye to pick up where the spray was being deposited. Really didn't hit anything in the low, a little bit less in the inner. So another way to look at this is this is the percent coverage. So this is how much pink versus how much white. And the higher numbers are better coverage. This is in the inner part of the canopy comparing 100 versus 50. There was no significant differences between 150 <coughs> gallons per acre if you looked at the inner part of the canopy. And we had very poor control, very poor coverage at low. 
and we were only getting up to about 50% coverage at the high part in the inner part of the canopy on that date. If you look at the outer canopy, it's a little bit better story. We did see a difference between 150 at the medium height. Still again, very low coverage at the low part of the canopy. So you might ask us, why did we have such low coverage on the low part of the canopy? We did some adjustments to the sprayer to see if we could increase our coverage down in that lower part of the canopy. So we lowered the trailer to its lowest setting. We also angled these bottom two nozzles for more downward coverage. We tried to improve our coverage on that lower part of the canopy. We came through and did this study again on September 21st. So here you can see we're finally getting some pink on those lower cards. And then this is 50 versus 100. And these are what representative cards. We did this with three, we had three replicate sticks for each of these places. So if you were to look at this as a graph of percent coverage, in the internal part of the canopy, on our second date, we did improve our coverage uh, and at the high, medium, and low heights, but there was no difference between 150 gallons per acre for the inner part of the canopy. If you look at the outer part of the canopy, we saw significantly better coverage with 100 gallons per acre compared to 50 gallons per acre for all three heights. And we're seeing the best coverage at that medium height because you're getting some overlap from the upper and lower nozzle. So one of the things I want you to take home from this is it's important to adjust your nozzles and your sprayer for your crop. I know many of you have one sprayer that you're using in all your crops. If you're coming through brambles, the settings are going to be different than if you're going through your orchards. And it's always important to calibrate and adjust the sprayer for that. Our coverage is inherently poor in the low part of the canopy and the center part of the canopy. Those are the hardest places to hit. And as Kevin mentioned earlier, and as we've seen, spotted wing drosophila likes the inner part of the canopy and the lower part of the canopy the most. So they most prefer to be where we least can hit them. And that's one of the challenges with this pest. Some other things I wanted to remind you about if you're using insecticides for preventing infestation. None of the products that are effective on spotted wing drosophila are very rain fast. So if you are, if there is a rain, you're going to have to reapply. Even one inch of rain is enough uh, to reduce the residue control for spotted wing drosophila. Keep an eye on the weather. Don't go out and spray just before a rain. Coverage is difficult in the inner part of the canopy and the lower part of the canopy. And increasing your gallons per acre does impre increase your coverage but it's increasing your coverage only in the outer part of the canopy, not so much in the inner part. The other thing I want to remind you about insecticides is the insecticides that we have for this pest really only target the adults. So if you have larvae, they're protected within the fruit. And if you go out there and you already have larvae in your fruit, those larvae can emerge as adults a few days later and it looks like you didn't even spray. So it's important to get in there before you have larvae in the fruit and it can require frequent applications to have an intensive management program because these flies reproduce so quickly. Now I'd like to move into some of our cultural controls research. So one of the things that we've been interested in is whether we can manipulate the habitat within the crop to make it less favorable for spotted wing drosophila. As Kevin mentioned, we know that they like the center part of the canopy and the lower part of the canopy, which may be due to having predation pressure from birds but it may also be due to the differences in the climate within the canopy compared to outside the canopy. So we think they like cooler and moister habitat. So if you can open up that canopy, make it drier and hotter, can you reduce its favorability? So Christopher Taylor is a postdoc in my lab who's been doing this work. And this work has been funded by the Maryland Ag Experiment Station and also the USDA OREI grant. <clears throat> so one of the first places we looked to see whether we could manipulate habitat was using different mulches and blueberries. So we compared a wood chip mulch to a plastic weed fabric over wood chip mulch. We deployed data loggers above the mulch and then buried it below the mulch so you can see the logger laying on top and then there's one below. Now we just heard about not using mulch and blueberries. Oh <laughs> uh, yes, well. <laughs> I do, I try to test things that you're currently doing. 
I'm not going to have, I'm not a horticulturalist, I'm an entomologist. <laughs> so this may or may not be bad for your plants. I'm testing whether it's good for your spot wing. <laughs> we're doing this at Keatiesville and we're doing this at the Y. We have second year blueberry plantings, so they're little, they're still little plants. One of the things that we compared was the number of times the temperature was greater than or equal to 87.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So 87.6 degrees Fahrenheit is a temperature that's been determined in the laboratory to be the first point where spotted wing drosophila look unhappy. So it doesn't kill them, but when we reach that level of temperature, they stop developing and they try to wait out for better conditions. So this is the first point where they're having some heat stress. So we're trying to compare how often it started to get too hot for them to be comfortable between these two different mulches. So if you look at temperature, both sites, it was significantly cooler below the mulch, so that buried data logger, compared to on top of the mulch, which you would expect. The sun is beating down on the top of the mulch. We have these small plants that aren't providing a lot of shade. <laughs> at the Y, the black weed fabric was hotter than the wood chip mulch. But we didn't see any difference at Keatiesville between the two mulches in terms of temperature. Just below is cooler. So the other thing I want to remind you is about their life cycle. We don't really know what the pupae do. There are some potential options. We have found pupae inside the fruit. So you see this picture of them inside the fruit with their little breathing tubes outside of the fruit in cherries and sometimes in blueberries. So it's possible they pupate within the fruit. Then those fruit could remain on the plant or those fruit could fall off the plant. The other thing that could happen is as larvae, they could leave the fruit and go down to the ground. If they leave the fruit and go down to the ground, do they pupate directly on top of the ground or do they bury themselves before they pupate? So we don't know which of those strategies they're using in which crop. We don't see pupae inside the fruit in blackberries or raspberries, so it's probable that they're leaving the fruit and going to the ground. Since we don't know which thing that they do, we decided to test both options. So we put the pupae exposed, attached them to a card, and then we had to put them inside a cage because we have collaborators who did this in Minnesota and the, the mice ate them. So you gotta protect them <laughs> for our research. So we put 20 exposed pupae, we buried them under the mulch or put them on top. And then we also put, let, bought some store-bought fruit, introduced it to spotted wing in the lab. So we we're sure we had 40 to 50 fruit inside, 40 to 50 eggs inside these fruit. And we put them above and below the mulch. At Keatiesville, we did this on July 21st for a full week, and then again on Aug from August 19th for a full week. At the Y, we did this on July 28th for a full week, and then August 11th. So these fruit and pupae were out in the field for a full week experiencing the field temperatures. We did do laboratory controls to make sure our flies were vigorous. So if we took the infested fruit, about 70% of them would survive to adulthood in the laboratory conditions. And for the pupae, about 90% of them survive to adulthood in laboratory conditions. What about those ones in the field? So the infested fruit at Keatiesville, no treatment did we have any survivorship. So they all died. At the Y, we did see a little bit of emergence um, below the, the weed fabric and better survival below the wood chips for the, the fruit that were infested. We look at the pupae. At Keatiesville, we did see a little bit of survival. It was about the same for all the treatments. So it didn't matter the mulch and it didn't matter, matter whether they were above or below. At the Y, we had a little bit better survivorship than at Keatiesville. And they really survived well below the wood chips, about as well as they did in the lab. So the question is, does this relate at all to the temperature they were experiencing? So we added up all the times that it got really hot between those, for those full two weeks between the black weed fabric above and below, wood chip mulch above and below, at Keatiesville and the Y. Coolest place? was the Y below the two mulches, 
with the absolute coolest being at the Y below the wood chip mulch. So we are seeing the best survival in the coolest places. And remember that Keatiesville had really poor survivorship? It was hotter above and below the mulch than the Y, which I didn't expect. I thought it was hotter over here, but turns out those weeks it was hotter at Keatiesville. So what we do know from the mulches is that we can impact their temperature, which may impact their survivorship. And we're going to continue to do some research to see the best way to do this. The other way we tried to manipulate the temperatures that they were experiencing in the climate was with pruning. So we were looking at pruning in primocane raspberries, which norm we cut to the ground as normal. When they came back up around early June, we thinned them out. So this no pruning is normal for, for primocanes at this time of year. Once they've come back up, you leave them alone. We did a medium pruning where we pulled out some of the canes, and we did a high pruning where we really opened up that canopy and removed more of the canes. These were completely unsprayed sites, so we had lots of spotted wing pressure. And they were second year plantings. So they are a little bit smaller than some of your plantings might be. The first thing we wanted to do, because we were kind of eyeballing the difference between the treatments, is to quantify how different that canopy really was by looking at how much leaf area there was. So the, for the high pruning through this whole talk, it's going to be the lightest color green because it has the, less, the least canopy. Then the medium is a medium green, and the no pruning had the densest canopy. It's the darkest green. So the, at Keatiesville, we were able to, st to separate the canopies so that there was a nice difference between low, medium, and high pruning. At the Y, we did not see as much of a difference. And there wasn't a st statistical difference in the canopy. So one of the first things we did was look at the differences in temperature. So we deployed a logger in the center part of the canopy and also on the outside of the canopy. And again, we measured every 20 minutes the temperature. And we did that for the full 12 weeks of the season. And again, it was the number of times that it was hotter than 87.6 degrees or equal to 87.6 degrees that we recorded. So you, if you look at temperature, in this case, the Y was hotter, and there was no difference between the, the treatments at all. So that we didn't get differences in the canopy, we didn't get differences in temperature at the Y. We did see a difference in the temperature at Keatiesville, where the de more dense canopy was cooler than those canopies that we opened up. The other thing we looked at for this study was some very quality parameters. So we measured bricks. We measured the penetration force, so we looked at how thick the skin was. We looked at the types of damage they received. We looked at the yield, and we measured these weekly, sampling one plant from the center of each of the three replicates from August to October, which was our harvest season. And we did separate these from outer berries, which were the six-inch outer ring of that canopy, and inner berries to do some comparisons there. I'm just going to focus on the overall results for you today. At Queenstown, we didn't see any difference in yield. So we didn't see a difference in the temperature, we didn't see a difference in the canopy, we didn't see a difference in the, in the yield between these treatments. At Keatiesville, we did see a difference in the canopy, we did see a difference in the temperature, we did see a difference in the yield. You're taking out fruit and canes, you're reducing your yield. So we're looking at a little bit less yield in the high and medium pruning compared to not pruning them at all. The other thing we measured was larval infestation. So we took 10 fruit randomly from those plants. <coughs> we floated out the spotted wing larvae and counted them and then compared them between these treatments. I'll give you a minute to look at this. The Keatesville Ke Village where we did see a difference in the canopy. Queenstown, we didn't see a difference in the canopy. Keatiesville, there was fewer larvae per berry, and this is completely unsprayed, so we had plenty of larvae per berry, uh, in the high and medium prune compared to the no prune treatment. So you're looking about one larva per fruit compared to 1.6 larvae per fruit at Keatiesville. And Queenstown actually had higher pressure, uh, and there was 
of the same, about the same number of larvae per fruit for all the treatments. So pruning can impact spotted winger softless habitat. If we have a denser canopy, we have cooler canopy, and we have more spotted wing. But if you prune it out, you have less yield. So I want to give you some reminders about other cultural control techniques uh, that I've mentioned in the past. One of the things to remember is that because spotted wing is reproducing so quickly, the population is really building over the season. So earlier types of fruit, earlier fruiting varieties within those types of fruit is the easiest way to have less spotted wing. So if you're planting new plantings, go for earlier varieties as much as possible. The other thing you have to remember if you have a diversified fruit farm is that spotted wing attacks a lot of hosts. So you have to keep a, an eye on all, all of your fruit through the whole season. Primocane raspberries and the small amounts of floricane fruit that you get first are often one of the first places that we see spotted wing. Post-harvest cherries is another good place to look for spotted wing on your farm if you have cherries because these are areas where you've stopped management You've moved on to other crops, but there's still some fruit out there for spotted wing. So far from our research, we found that habitat can impact spotted wing drosophila, um, but we're doing further research on what's the best way for you to do this on your farm and how that will fit into your production practices. So just some reminders, many of you have diversified farms, so you really have many susceptible crops. Uh, and you have to keep an eye on all your susceptible fruit for all season for your spotted wing management. Uh, and I know many of you are lab labor limited, so this is something you can do your best to, to, to look at this and think about this um, because often you do have a lot of on-farm sources of spotted wing, but there's also alternate hosts in the woods. So this is a really challenging pest to manage because it attacks so many fruits. Chemical controls remain the most reliable way to manage spotted wing drosophila. And it's important to keep an eye on the weather. If it's rained, you may have to reapply. And also make sure you're calibrating your sprayer. Check your spray coverage. You can get water sensitive cards. You can get white cards and use pink dye um, to check your spray deposition and make sure that that spray is going where you think it's going. There are a lot of people out there who are looking for monitoring and management strategies, so we'll keep updating you as new and better options come, come around, but for now it's still focusing on chemical controls. If you would like more information on spotted wing drosophila, we do have a fact sheet out. UM, you can Google UMD fact sheet FS 1023. You can also ask me and I'll send it to you. You can go to my lab website, hambylab.weebly.com, and there's a link for it there. It does have crop specific spray tables, so we didn't talk about which materials to spray, but these spray tables will tell you they're grouped by different modes of action. So you want to make sure that you're rotating between modes of action to reduce the risk of this insect developing insecticide resistance. And it also has a ranking uh, all around the United States entomologists have ranked these products in their effectiveness. So it does have rankings for how, how effective they are for spotted wing drosophila. If you're an organic grower, our OREI project has a specific website. You can Google spotted wing organic or go to eorganic.info backslash spotted wing organic and that will tell you all about what types of um, research is going on and different ways to manage spotted wing on an organic farm. And I know you hate surveys, but it's really important it's how I helped prioritize my research and extension to have these evaluations and need assessments. And I also use these evaluations to try to improve my talks and will be using them when I go up for tenure to try to demonstrate that I'm improving. So there are a lot of people who help me with this work. I like to thank the research farms and the labor there. I have a bunch of fruit plantings that we put in and we have to maintain. And so I really appreciate all of that labor. And I'm open for any questions or discussion. We should have time for that. Yeah, that survey color is actually in your folder. And is that yes, color it's, color? It's, it's golden colored. Guy? Great work. Uh, it, it, 
you know, it's like the spot wing in the uh, the tar oh, no, 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 so the question was, why don't we know more about spotted wing Mesophila's biology? Um, one of the issues with looking for bugs is that when you can't find them, you don't know why. So a lot of us go out and look for them, but we haven't been able to see pupae. I've put a lot of soil cores in the ground and pulled them up to try to find spotted wing pupae, and all I find is empty cases. And those could be any bugs pupae. So it's one of those things that no data doesn't tell you anything. Um, and there are people who are developing some interesting approaches like dyeing them to try to figure out more information about that, but it's just a tricky one to figure out what it's up to. Could you put a cage in the lab? And in the laboratory, they, do, they seem to behave very differently than they do in the wild. So we keep them in the laboratory. Well, we know that they don't do this because in the laboratory, what we do is they'll crawl up on paper towels and pupate. So they don't really have paper towels in the field. And I've never seen them pupating on leaves in the raspberry canopy either. So.